Santo Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It is hour three of the Jeff Santo Show, and welcome to it, folks. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in the Commonwealth of uh, Massachusetts. We're going to go uh, 3,000 miles away for our next two guests. Uh, we're going to start off with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield up there in the 206, some 3,000 miles away in the great Pacific Northwest. You can take Interstate 90 from uh, Boston right behind Fenway Park and drive all the way right there to Interstate 5 and uh, intersecting there in Seattle, WA. Then we're going to go down south on 5 and talk to our good friend Greg Pallast. Great investigative journalist writing some uh, great stuff on Louisiana and find out what's going on there. And, of course, that's Los Angeles, California, the uh, city of angels. That's what they say anyways. I don't know about that. Uh, and we may come back, may come back and uh, come all the way back to Boston and talk to Julian McWilliams of the Boston Globe. That is still tentative right now. But all right, let's go out to the Pacific uh, West and the Pacific Northwest, to be more precise, and find our man. He is the Renaissance man. He is on a boat right now in the great Puget Sound. He is uh, the fantastic Mark Taylor Canfield, Democracy Watch News, the Jeff Santo Show, and, of course, always enterprising journalism, which gets him on the boats in Seattle. And that's where he is right now. Mark. Mark, whereabouts are you in Puget Sound? Maybe you're not. Maybe you're in Lake Washington. I'm not sure. I am indeed on the inland waterways of the Salish Sea. Um, you have to go through the locks. I'm just about to be um, boarded by a mallard duck. She's very, very interested in our salad and would like to join us. But I'm sorry, uh, sweetie, you're going to have to go your own way. Yes. <laughs> and two, two, and two no, no salad for you. You now have two Canadian geese as uh, fans of the show. They've, they've uh, there you go. accompanied us. I love the Canadians. Yeah. yeah, they're Canadian geese, so they're cool. They're not very violent. They're you know, right wing. They're just kind of chill. They, they're okay with democratic socialism and universal health care. Uh, right. Single payer, baby. I'm, here. I'm wearing my uh, New York Giants baseball cap, which is kind of pissed off my neighbor currently because he was all decked out in his Seattle Mariners regalia <laughs> and he saw me and he was like, what the? You know, I'm like, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. Be Just careful. A gift from a friend. I don't want to start a fight or anything. And then another thing about trademarks and brands. You know, I got invited on this really wealthy guy's boat out here, right? Which was great. But you know what? He served me. What he served everybody was Coors. I mean, give me a break. This is Seattle, land of some of the best microbrewers in the world, where you can. You buy ended up getting an Coors. Adolf Coors. Up. Oh, my word. So these rich people that moved to Seattle, they're still drinking Coors. I mean, and they could afford much, much better, Jeff. So I just said, look, next time, uh, give me a call. I'm going to bring... At least could get you some Sierra Nevada, Nevada, for crying out loud. You know, I mean, I know it's no, California. I'm but... some Georgetown Brewery stuff or some uh, Elysian Brewery or even maybe this Silver City, which we happen to have today, called Ride the Spiral, which is not recommended for... Um, for, uh, driving the boat, I would guess. <laughs> yeah, well, if I you're driving the boat, drunk. don't don't drink the uh, no, don't no. drink the stuff. Um, no, but the, the IPAs are higher alcohol content. They're more like a good stiff ale if you were in Europe. So if you're okay with you know a good ale from England or you know the Alsace Lorraine region of France, where I used to drink some really great beer, that's okay. Um, but if you're not used to it, definitely don't buy it for your friend's 21st birthday party because they won't remember anything the next day. Well, but that's for sure. That's just because IPAs are a little bit stronger. But they taste better, and they're longer brewed. brewed. There's a lot more hops. So if you don't like hops, um, I would go for a pale ale or something like that if you come to Seattle. But it has some of the best beer in the world. And I have traveled in Europe where you know all, all of this uh, tradition came from and all that craftsmanship. Well, it's now... Um, been hijacked and moved to Seattle because we have some of the best microbrews in the world. And there's so many now, Jeff, that I told my favorite beer storekeeper, he has like 400 different kinds of beers at his little shop here. He said, I said, I want to try every IP that's available in Seattle. He said, good luck. There's like over 300 breweries within the Puget Sound area now. So it's huge. It's a huge industry. Even during the pandemic, people couldn't go out, but they were going to the grocery store and getting their beer. So, you know, it's recreational here, and it's not Coors. 
I highly recommend a good microbrew from Seattle if you can get it in your part of the country uh, or, or from Europe because uh, Coors sucks. Uh, that's all I have to say. All right. I'm done. And I'm not I, look, you're not going to get a disagreement from so me. I, I think one of the I, – I would drink in the past – I don't really drink the domestic Budweiser uh, Miller stuff, which is not very good. Now that they're owned by, what, South African and Belgian companies, it's not even American. Uh, but Coors is, is not even in the same consideration. Uh, you know, it's just not very good. But now, Sierra I Nevada, I, 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 I like from California. So they, there you go. Yes. Yeah, we get local I stuff agree. here. We get Narragansett and, and all these other th- the other mm-hmm. co- companies down here in, in uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Hey, I want to take you I from the world of beer, that. which I could talk to you off the air for two hours about, uh, to some <laughs> serious issues that I think uh, maybe we could uh, give Joe Biden some beers and get him to really think straight here. Um, I'm concerned about what we are seeing with climate climate change in the great uh, cities of New Orleans and New York City, uh, in Philadelphia, in, in the state of New Jersey. And that is these horrific uh, storms. Um, you know, these are things that don't happen normally, but we are not living in real, uh, we're not really living in normal times anymore. Climate change is here. Uh, it has been here for a while. And if we don't do something about it quickly by the next nine years, by 2030, uh, we're going to be we're going to be without a, a a world because this this planet is going to is going to evaporate. Um, I'm concerned that they are not willing in the Biden administration. And I want to get your thoughts on this, Mark, uh, with your progressive friends there in Seattle, one of the more progressive cities in the country, if not the most progressive. That he Biden and his team is reluctant. To roll out the red carpet for people who have solutions for the concerns of this country, and I'm talking about AOC and Senator Ed Markey, who have written the uh, Green New Deal. Um, They should be, and we just talked with our good friend Harvey Kay, a great FDR historian, uh, and, you know, the idea to me is a Rose Garden uh, press conference enacting the elements of the Green New Deal in that $3.5 trillion and having AOC and Ed Markey alongside Biden talking about this. And, and even Biden can say, look, you can tell them in a private meeting before they go out in the Rose Garden, look, I'm not 100% with everything you guys have, but I believe in 89, 90% of it, and we're going to get this done. We're going to go on the road together. We're going to make sure this gets passed, and, and there's no stopping us now. We are family. You know, 1979, Sister Sledge. So, with that, I want to get your thoughts and whether or not they would be popular. And I would, I, I can't imagine it wouldn't be. Jay Inslee was on, your governor, uh, talking about this concern today. I think that, you know, again, you guys could be the first. You could really lead the revolution, if you might, as you did with marijuana, as you did with $15 minimum wage at SeaTac. And I'm just wondering, you know, if, if, it, maybe they they got to put the tour and they got to start it in Seattle first. Well, to quote the tragically hit song, that great band from the eighties, "New Orleans is sinking, man, and I don't want to swim." I highly recommend that band. Uh, and if you're in Seattle, you're going to get a huge argument if you are a climate change denier. Uh, for sure. Um, luckily, it has been more humid up here, more normal, more like normal Seattle in the rainforest area where it's been a bit cloudy and actually even a little chilly and, and a little bit of rain humidity lately. But that's really good for the forest, so we're really glad to see that. And it's a little overcast today, and I'm actually glad that it's not smoke, Jeff, that it's actually, uh, you know, normal cloudy Seattle skies. But, uh, I, I'm thinking about all this stuff, and, and we talked before about the arguments that you would get from people if you moved to Seattle or visited Seattle, and you were either a pandemic denier or a, or a uh, climate change denier. Because, as you know, up there on the Northeast, you know, you've experienced some really inclement uh, understatement of the of the century weather lately. And so you know what I'm talking about. And in Seattle politics, if you're not green, you're not going to get elected. So forget it. You know, don't even try. So first of all, we value our environment and we try to keep it 
cool here. We try to keep it unpolluted and natural as much as we can. Yes, there's overdevelopment in the cities, but there are a lot of unprotected areas and forests where there's, you know, there's no development allowed. And we want the rivers and the streams to be clean and and the right temperature and everything for the salmon so they can continue to spawn. A lot of the First Nations people around here have huge ceremonies around uh, the salmon runs every year. And we even see salmon runs in some of our local parks in Seattle. Um, so it's very important to us. Our, our icons and our mascots for our sports teams, the Seahawk, of course, it's a hawk that lives on the waters of um, the Salish Sea in Puget Sound. Um, now we've got the Kraken, the hockey team, which, by the way, Jeff, my um, teacher from high school, my favorite teacher who still stays in touch with me, she's a huge hockey fan and plays herself. And so wow. she's super psyched to see the Kraken here. And also, I'm looking out at the pirate ship I was telling you guys out about before that tours through the Salish Sea in Lake Washington, and they have a real cannon. They actually have, uh, they're flying the Kraken NHL flag, uh, uh, team flags right now. So everybody's kind of into that symbol as well. Um, you know, the Mariners is about, you know, sailors and living on the sea. So everybody's right. very in tune with nature here and the weather. And so I think, you know, if we can set an example, it would be that in your local politics that you have to have candidates running, whether it's your school board or your city council or especially for mayor or county executive, get somebody in there who, if they're, you know, if they're not a member of the Green Party, at least, you know, a Democrat who's green or an independent who's green, somebody who really believes that the environment should come first, because we all live on this planet together. It's an international and global issue. It's not just a local issue, but it all connects locally when you have the kind of storms that you've been experiencing and you see the changes in the weather and the climate and its effect on the wildlife and the flora and fauna around you. So, I would say that, yes, Seattle could set an example, but you also have members of Congress who are a bit revolutionary in their own way. Speaking of the Revolution Radio Network, um, they, by the way, best talk show in the United States. I'm still um, arguing. <laughs> I'm not having to argue with anyone. No one has, has opposed me on that, but I'm still saying Thank that you, all the time. Appreciate that. But there Appreciate isn't any you. revolution that's happened. You know, and this, this show is a part of it. It's a a more free-form, innovative, you know, cutting-edge conversation that you don't hear in most corporate media. And I think people are really hungry for that, especially in this part of the country. So we need to work on and getting you on more stations out here. But there's a way of, um, love that. of doing this kind of politics that I talked about before, which can be coalition politics, and you've mentioned it too. If the Progressive Caucus can gain enough political power to actually force some decisions because they need to be a part of the coalition, and so the Democrats are like, hey, you know, uh, AOC and, you know, Pramila Jayapal and these folks are not going to go for this, then, you know, they're forced to be reckoned with. And if they don't win every time on every issue, at least they can get make some significant um, ground. Because I, I watch Pramila Jayapal all the time. She's a friend and, you know, long-time loved 80% winner of the vote <laughs> kind of candidate from Seattle. We all love her here. And Bernie Sanders loves her. I think uh, watching her is a great example, too. Every day you see what she has to say on Twitter and other social networking platforms, and it's always about universal health care, free education, uh, saving the planet, you know, protecting the environment, um, getting people vaccinated. Everything that progressives say that they're for, she's out there fighting for it. Women's rights, are you kidding me? Um, the Supreme Court decision on uh, eviction moratorium, she was all over that. And she's usually out on the front on most of these issues. Then you start to hear about it from the other members of Congress because she's out there rattling cages and knocking on doors and making phone calls, making sure that people listen to her. And she is kind of a force to be reckoned with. You know, she's a nice person. She's not a divisive kind of figure, but she is very uh, stubborn. Let's put it that way. Well, it's stalwart and stubborn at the same time. I mean, she just doesn't give up. And she's never... She's, what's the word, undaunted. You know, she just never loses her inspiration. She's just, I'm going to do this, I don't care. You know, <laughs> you can either support me or not. <laughs> and, and that's really cool to see that in a political figure. So if we can get more people like that, and more like AOC and Omar and all these people that are fighting against the person, the person that you mentioned to me off the air, uh, who happens to be a member of the Democratic Party, although I call those guys, and this, you know who I'm talking about, it starts with an M, his last name, uh, I think he's a Demo-Publican, actually. I don't really think he's a Democrat. I think no, he is Republicrat, and they're Demo-Publicans. That's what I call them, where they're just a Democrat because it happened to suit their fancy for the moment. <laughs> you know, they're not even really independent. They have a very right-wing sort of 
uh, goal. And I want to, you know, once again, um, quote Thomas Jefferson. You know, he said that commercial nations, right, their major principle and governing principle is is not morality, it's money. And we have to really watch out for that and watch out for people who never side with the working class and never side with the poor folks because who do they represent? They don't represent those folks. You know, they represent the upper one point or point zero zero five percent or whatever. And a lot of them live in Seattle. So I know what we're talking about here. It's a very elite group of people who have control of our government and our media right now. And man, uh, my support goes to anybody who's trying to be independent and support nonprofit news organizations and independent community radio and television and online channels because we need you right now. And don't give up the hope. And, you know, uh, listen to what Pramila Jayapal has to say, because she will inspire you every day to get out there and fight for these progressive causes, because somebody's got to do it. And if it's Seattle, yeah, somebody has to. It, yeah, we'll do it. We're Seattle. We're not changing. Yeah, I think that you guys uh, are critical in this fight, because, well... Seattle has proven, and I mentioned the two things, the marijuana initiative uh, and legalization, and of course the, uh, more importantly, I think, the $15 minimum wage from SeaTac, and it, and it spread. Uh, you know, unfortunately, not like wildfire, uh, but you know, enough states and uh, your friends in Colorado and marijuana and obviously a number of states, even including the the uh, draconian uh, uh, lunatic fringe uh, in Florida, even passed $15 minimum wage in a, in a uh, uh, statewide initiative back in, in 2020. So, you know, again, what we're hoping that you can start the fire, not literally, of course, we don't want any fires in the West particularly, uh, but I think that that's an, an important piece. And I, and I think culturally, too, um, you know, it can be very much the case in California. Uh, a lot of things uh, get sold in L.A. What did uh, Glenn Fry? you don't know, you know about this, I believe he had a song that says, you know, they make it in Miami and they buy it in L.A., um, you know, so, and then you sell it in L.A. Um, I think he was talking about uh, cocaine uh, in the song. Um, but, um, you know, th the, the theory is here is that we need to do more and I, I just feel that we're running out of time. Climate change is here, and if we don't do something with the $3.5 trillion and we don't push the people who are the co-sponsors of it and get them out there, not just Joe Biden, who is not exactly, you know, Mr. Excitement on the microphone, I, I think we're just, you know, you know not... not that's another statement of the year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not utilizing the weapons we have. And AOC and Ed Markey, you know, know this like the back of their hands, and, you know, they have the passion to sell it. Let them loose. Release the hounds, Mark. Yeah, and stay away from those politicians who basically, uh, you know, if you ask them why they ran for office and they were honest with you over a drink late at night, they would say what Dillinger said when they asked him why he robs banks, because that's where the money's at. So they're exactly. in it for other reasons. They're in it for self-promotion. But you really can't stop the progressive cause. I mean, it is the, history is on our side. Uh, every time the corporate political leaders and their uh, lackeys, you know, in Congress put roadblocks in the way, they really just show how out of date they are and out of touch they are and how foolish they are. Um, I, I'm in the uh, I'm in the Greta Thunberg um, camp, you know. Um, they're, they're showing old world 20th century tendencies, and that's not really what, what we need today. That's not where things are at right now. Um, we need a fresh new approach because a lot of those um, neoliberal approaches have not really worked out so well for the working class and the poor folks. So ask the construction workers who are about ready to go on strike in Seattle who can't afford to live in the city where they work. By the way, Jeff, on a positive note, Hopefully, um, I just I entered a drawing to go into space because oh, I'm good! Go you 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 uh, you gonna get a first hand ride from uh, Mr. Bezos there? <laughs> uh, no, it would be from it would be actually be from Richard Branson, right? The, oh the wow! Branson well, guy. he's the cooler of the two, anyways. Yeah, it would be it's it would be a flight on their new galactic um, plane, and I know you know part of the reason that they they did this is so that people like me would talk about it, but I think it's cool. I grew up, you know loving space toys and being really into Star Trek and stuff that was, you know, Star Wars and stuff that was really sci-fi. And I studied astronomy, you know, in, at the university and as well as um, music. So I feel like that would be super cool. And then 
to be like the first person to give a rock concert from space would be like my life's goal, man. That would be, wow. so awesome. that would be so very that, cool. Be like, Live from Mars, it's Mark Tan- Taylor Canfield and band. <laughs> yes. What a It'll satellite hookup that would be. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I would be satisfied just to do it from orbit around the Earth. I think it would be really cool. I think, what was it, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or one of those new sci-fi shows where they had to set up their band called Demolition Alley or something on, on the moon of the planet because it was too loud to actually set up on the planet because it would just destroy all the buildings with their huge speakers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so hey, let me, let me, up a uh, of the uh, let me Your tell you. Went up to 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it goes to 11, my friend. Um, the, the scenario, our great friends, Rob Ryan and Spinal Tap. Um, let, me, let me just uh, do this because it's got a, a couple of minutes left here. You know, we've been playing um, the, the great U2 Green Day classic, uh, The Saints Are Coming. Um, one of our great uh, listeners, Wayne, uh, really gets it because he has a lot of relatives in New Orleans that suffered through Katrina, which, of course, now, what, 15 years later, um, we're in, the, in a similar situation um, with, uh, with the storm Ida uh, that affected New Orleans. Now 900,000 people without power. And, you know, music back then, and it can play a role uh, to inspire people, you know, again, and I know that's something that I know you would do in a second uh, to get people to understand, but at the same time, music and Sean Penn going back there and private industry and Peyton Manning who played in New Orleans, his father was a big quarterback with, uh, with the Saints. The government has to play a role, and I think that's a big part of it. Uh, and you know, and the government can pay you and pay you know Eddie Vedder and Green Day to play the bands, and you too as well. So you know, your thoughts. You got thirty seconds, man. Well, they supported a lot of local businesses and local clubs and musicians and artists during the pandemic. Why can't that continue? And that's one of the arguments that Pramila Jayapal and AOC and others have. It's like, okay, so we learned what democratic socialism looks like and how uh, effective it can be in changing people's lives. Let's continue it. No and doubt. Jeff Gesto on the radio. Check me out at YouTube, Instagram, and SoundCloud. See you later. Hey, man, be careful on the waterways of uh, Seattle, WA. Uh, you rock the great Mark Taylor Canfield, the renaissance man of the Jeff Santo Show, out there in Puget Sound. Be careful. Have a great Labor Day weekend, man. We'll talk to you next week. It's the Jeff Santo Show. Our friend Greg Palace will be with us after this commercial timeout. We will talk baseball next week. Mr. McWilliams on a plane cannot get to a phone between now and six o'clock so politics with palace is next with srn news i'm keith peters in washington president biden has signed an executive order directing the fbi to declassify documents related to the september 11th 2001 terrorist attacks the order friday is a supportive gesture to victims families who have long sought the records in hopes of implicating the Saudi government. Still, the practical impact of the executive order and any new documents it might yield was not immediately clear. Past investigations have outlined ties between Saudi nationals and some of the airplane hijackers, but have not established that the government was directly involved. A mixed day on Wall Street as the Dow was down by 74 points. The Nasdaq, however, rose 32 the S&P 500 declined one. Oil dropped 70 cents to 69.29 a barrel. This is the Jeff Santo Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santo Show that you are tuned into. As promised, we would go from Seattle with our good friend MTC uh, down the Pacific Coast. Not only the Pacific Coast Highway, but Interstate 5 that goes down to Los Angeles, where we find uh, the best investigative journalists in the nation. There is nobody who does it better, as the song goes. Um, and I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. Um, I'm not uh, that crazy. Uh, <laughs> then our good friend Greg Pallast. He is uh, the author of a number of books, including uh, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Uh, and he has uh, done a number of, of stories. Uh, and he's talked on this very program for over a decade on the concern over stealing votes, which is a subject of voting rights, which he has been fighting on. 
and today, after writing a couple of stories on this, he has really taken on what is happening to the people in uh, the great state of Louisiana. Some 900,000 people uh, are without electricity, and there's some reasons behind that. And here to talk about it is the great Greg Palast, and he joins us uh, from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California. I don't know if there are any angels out there, Greg, but uh, there certainly are some saints, and you're one of them. How are you doing, my man? Okay, I hope you're staying dry. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thankfully, after 20, 48 hours, there. yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, I, uh, I've had a, I'm, this issue of the lights going on in Louisiana is very close to me, because in 1986... Remember, before I was an investigative reporter, I was an investigator, and I particularly was focusing on power companies. And in 1986, the city of New Orleans hired me because the lights kept going out, and the bills were soaring. And they had a company, uh, it is now called Entergy, their local subsidiary, uh, New Orleans Public Service, and they wanted me to investigate. And what I, and what I concluded, and this week kind of proves it again that the power company Entergy it's it's actually a racketeering enterprise parading as a power company and I made two recommendations first find them about 150 million dollars which is the most I could squeeze out bankrupting them at the time and they, the city did that and I said something else you need socialism you can't let these privateers these power pirates run your electric system unless you want you're going to die. You're going to drown. city of New Orleans is below sea level. It operates on electric pumps to keep it uh, um, from uh, being drowned. And we know that that's already happened. And, um, you know, in after Katrina, which is 16 years ago, after Katrina, um, they took over a year, Entergy, to put the lights back on New Orleans. Over one year. Yeah. And then... They got all this money to fix up and harden their system, as they call it. There's a report from the uh, uh, Department of Energy. Uh, they actually have a system reliability office there. And they put a report, and they said, look, it's a hurricane area. you got to withstand at least a Category 3 hurricane. And so that means putting some lines underground, raising some uh, power uh, uh, substations uh, uh, way, way high above the ground on, uh, on hills, and then having some portable, you, these, you get these big uh, flatbed semis with big portable trans, uh, tr- um, generators, plus, um, you know, simple things like putting extra guy wires on the tower so they don't fall down. And guess what? Last week, 2,000 miles of high voltage lines. We're not talking about, you know, the, the lines down your, your street. We're talking about those giant towers, which are never never, ever, ever supposed to fall down. They lost 2,000 miles of high-voltage transmission line. I haven't, you know, I traveled, I worked around the world. I didn't see that in Bangladesh. I'm not kidding. Um, and Oh, it's disgusting. So, We're yeah. so far behind, Greg. I had a, One of our callers, yeah. John, who we'll maybe get a chance to talk to, was talking to me about a German uh, individual coming, coming from uh, Berlin. This is a country, of course, that was bombed into the smithereens in 1945 and then rebuilt itself, thanks to a lot of the Marshall Plan and so forth, but still, mm-hmm. and has the state-of-the-art technology. A great, a great infrastructure plan for Germany. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay. And what ends up happening is that they come over here, maybe this is a 40 years ago, and they look at these overhead wires that you see, you would see in the 1930s King Kong movies that are still there today. They're in New York, they're in New England, they're in New Orleans, and, you know, there's nothing new about them, even though they have names new in the fr- beginning of their uh, their names of the cities. And, and frankly, this is embarrassing. And the fact that most new homes have the electricity underneath the, uh, the, the home, we don't do that. We don't make that. To me, that's Joe Biden. He should have Ed Markey and AOC at a Rose Garden next week, and he should talk about the fact that we need to go big time here because the people of New York and New Orleans deserve better because this is climate change is not going away. It's here to stay, and we've got to combat it. And the only way we're going to do it is to put in trillions like FDR did to overhaul what is happening in this country. I, I, I would presume you would well, agree with me. There's, there's two things we have to worry about. 
One is, you know, like you say, infrastructure. I mean, uh, my, you know, my wife is Swiss, and I go there. They come here, and they go, what? What, what, what are these, like, power lines over your head? Exactly, Remember, right. We put sewage, just think about it, we put sewage lines underground, but if a sewage line breaks, it's not pretty, but you don't die. You put a power line overhead and it breaks, you got a problem. Uh, you know, and remember, it's not just the lights in your house, and, but you, the stores don't function. When you see people waiting in line, they can't get food. You can't get water because the water system runs on electricity, too. And so you end up, you know, this idea that we have a discussion about whether to fix infrastructure is in any other country considered, including that I've been to Vietnam and, and other places, it's like nuts. In fact, I checked the reliability of the U.S. power system. We have some, there's an index, an international index called the SAID, and we are, our number is 240 versus like Europe, which is 70. What that means is that our system is, is you know, it's, it's uh, like Libya at this moment after the war. Um, so the truth is, is that, number one, you don't have a discussion about whether you fix infrastructure. Number two, we have a crime wave in the area of infrastructure because we have privateers running our power system. And, you know, energy siphons off the money. One of the things that happened after Katrina is that uh, this big monster company, Entergy, um, it, uh, it, it put its New Orleans subsidiary, when it went dark and the system was destroyed in New Orleans, they put their New Orleans subsidiary into bankruptcy. That let them off the hook on the liabilities for all their negligence. Years of being given money to fix the system, which they didn't harden the system. It's not like a hurricane in uh, Louisiana is an odd thing. Come on, are you kidding? It's not like, oh my God, it was a volcano. No, it was something that happens every year in Louisiana. Exactly. And they, they got out of the liability. They got out of having to upfront the money for the fix-up. And then after they got out of bankruptcy and the system was back on, they said, oh, thanks, it's ours now. Thank you very much. They took it. But then, once again, they put up towers that you could, you know, the big bad wolf could blow over. Uh, this is ridiculous. And so the, this is a crime wave that parading is a power company, and we have let this happen. In fact, I'm very concerned that there is a lot of money for transmission systems in the infrastructure bill. But if we're going to turn it over to these, um, you know, to these basically kilowatt mafia um, I'm very concerned about where the money's going to end up. And by the way, Entergy, when it put its New Orleans subsidiary in bankruptcy after Katrina, in the three months in, that included the, the Katrina blackout, the company's profit jumped 24%. They said because of weather. In other words, Katrina. What they did was they, New Orleans was out. The, the, the trans, you know, their whole transmission system was out, so New Orleans went dark. And then they took, so they took New Orleans power in the middle of a storm, sold it for a premium price elsewhere. Nice. So they they cheated. So they you know they flattened New Orleans, walked away from responsibility, but then made a profit off of selling the New Orleans power. I mean, these are this is so it's none of this when I see New Orleans in the dark. And understand, the federal law requires that you have a system which is reliable, and if it does go down, that you have it back up in days. That's the law. These guys are breaking the law, and I don't hear anyone saying, this is a crime. They're just saying, oh, it's an act of God. Well, no, it's not an act of God. It's an act of greed by a corporation. And, and you can read more at gregpalace.com. Well, it is no doubt, and we're going to open up the phones here in a couple of seconds and, and talk to our good friend John about that uh, comment that he had heard uh, with this German yeah. individual coming up here at 772 We should not have lines over our okay, Of course, it's insane. It's 2021, not 1921. Uh, and, you know, this is this is the kind of things we don't invest in. And this is why that Green New Deal, that $3.5 trillion, along with the bipartisan junk that Joe Manchin gave us and was basically standing in the way of this nonsense. You know, this is the other thing, too, uh, Greg, that really, really angers me, is you have politicians like Joe Manchin, who end up with tremendous largesse. His daughter is a multi-billionaire with a pharmaceutical company. His wife gets all the, uh, the uh, money from the federal government because they've been trying to win him over for the last nine months. It, it to me, is... It's just out of control, and I, I'm I'm telling you, I I am at my wit's end with uh, this 
conservative Democrats like Manchin, like Cinema, not far from you there in, in, in Arizona, it, it really angers me that these people are going to hold up voting rights, going to hold up uh, people who go to col- community college for free, hold up seniors' opportunities to get actually free dental and free, uh, you know, if eye and hearing aids and so forth. That these these Medicare Advantage idiots, including. Hollywood people like J.J. J. Walker of Good Times and William Shatner now, and of course Joe Namath, the the um, overrated football player from the Jets. You know, I mean, this is the stuff that you know they're selling, and they're actually selling what Bernie Sanders is is you know is putting into that legislation, and you can't get it done because of stooges like Mr. Manchin. Your thoughts there? Well, look, Manchin represents one of the poorest, most devastated. Uh, states in this nation and he's not representing those people there is no one who needs medical care long-term care in west virginia no one that needs a rebuilding of the infrastructure which was based on coal and and you know and you can get rid of ev- you can you can eliminate the environmental protection agency you can you can do handstands but you can't get even creepy companies like Entergy are not going to burn coal. It's too expensive, okay? It's just too expensive. You know, it's just the, the wind, wind power is cheaper, gas power is cheaper, and solar power is, is getting down there to be cheaper. They're not going to buy coal. And if, unless you rebuild that state, in, in fact, almost no one works in the coal industry today in West Virginia. That's all, that's all kind of in, you know, Woody Guthrie songs. It's not in reality. What the reality is is that the biggest industry in West Virginia is tourism. It's what FDR built. The uh, the Appalachian Trail is the biggest industry, you know, basically in the Smoky Mountains, et cetera. These, this is the big industry of West Virginia. And that can only be preserved as an industry if the environment there is preserved and if there's infrastructure to get people in and out to those places, not... Uh, and, and, of course, taking care of the people there so that they aren't stuck in those dead-end towns uh, that where the coal ain't coming back. And I was just talking to uh, some uh, coal mining region friends of mine. They say, you know, people are waiting. You know, they're waiting for Trump to, to restore the coal mining industry. Well, you can, you know, he had those guys with the little, you know, with the hard hats with the little lights on in front. And he got rid of all those EPA rules that he got rid of by uh, executive order. And he said, you know what this means, boys? You're going back to work. Well, they are back to work. There's nothing that can save that industry. And Manchin is not representing those people by getting in the way of the desperate uh, funding that they need to restore West Virginia. Yeah, and no doubt. Uh, talking with the great uh, Greg Pallast here on the Jeff Santo Show. Uh, let's go to the phones and uh, talk with our, our good friend, uh, Mr. John. He, of course, uh, from the great city of Minneapolis. And uh, let's go to him right now. You are next with Greg Pallast. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm originally from Long Island, and I would say Long Island Lighting uh, Company was one of the worst uh, utilities probably in the nation and it was. Uh, they have since uh, gone out of business but uh, it, it was after Hurricane Sandy that uh, some uh, I don't know why they were there but they were looking at the infrastructure there were people from Germany you know looking at the infrastructure of the of the power lines and noticing that you know they were all overhead and they said this is like pre-world war two uh, infrastructure, you know, why Why do they have this? And, you know, they're legalized monopolies, they influence uh, the pol- political machine there, and they get what they want, they get their salaries, they've, you know, squeezed for years. Well, in fact, uh, yeah. Keep the rest of, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, John, you should, uh, what you might know, this is Greg Powell's talking, um, yeah. is uh, I directed the state's investigation of Long Island Lighting after Hurricane Gloria when it was when the, the, the lights went out, and the Shoreham Nuclear Plant. And I directed, yep. I wrote the racketeering uh, case that was successful against Lilco, the Long Island Lighting Company, and I also wrote the law for the state, which converted to a public system. So Lilco was put out of business by our racketeering suit and purchased by the state, and the rates right. were uh, were cut by $400 million by going 
socialist by going Republican. And furthermore, you had a massive um, improvement in reliability. For example, for those who know Long Island, it's like a shaped like a fish with like a tail at the end. And once it became a public, and it was always so, by, when you got to the end of the island, it was always running out of power. I lived on the North Fork, in fact, of Long Island for a while. It, it mm-hmm. kept, the lines kept going down. So what we actually did, once it became a public system, and you had a, they, you know, suddenly uh, the politicians are responsible for keeping the lights on. They ended up running a line from the north to the south, so there's a nice loop. So reliability massively increased until Hurricane Andrew, a guy named Andrew Cuomo, who then sold, okay, we had taken this renegade system, made it public, improved the system, spent about four billion dollars improving it, closed a crappy nuclear plant, and then Andy Cuomo sold it off to his cronies. And now, once again, it's a private system where, after the public rebuilt this thing, Andrew Cuomo yeah. sold it off, and that alone should have gotten him impeached. That alone yeah. was. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think you were saying, Greg, Mario Cuomo in the 90s did the right thing. His son, Andrew, did the wrong thing. And that's why Mario yeah. is rolling his grave right now. Uh, talking to the great Greg <laughs> Palast here on the Jeff Santos Show. Uh, and John, of course, a Long Islander. And, of course, Puck, we will not forget you, my friend. We were, you, know, you are in our hearts. Uh, so, Puck, keep on, on uh, doing the right thing. Um, John, thank you for the call. I, what I think is important here, Greg, is that... There, the the corruption. We need to put an end to what is happening now. You know, interestingly enough, Biden, and I'm not just picking on this, but you know, we're talking with Harvey K, our great uh, uh, professor, uh, and of course, um, uh, the great Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, done a lot of uh, great history books on FDR. I think it's time that um, the Biden administration really looks at their declining poll numbers and say, if you're going to survive, you're going to have to go left. You're going to have to go to the Bernie Sanders left in order to survive, because that's where the votes are. That's where the future is. Young people are Bernie Sanders supporters, AOC supporters, etc. That's where you need to go. And they're union people. Exactly. And And by, By the way, it's very important, because I was in Ohio in 12... And, uh, well, no, and I was in 16. I've been there several times doing, uh, investigating vote suppression. But one thing I did find, I went to the UAW um, headquarters in, um, in Dayton, Ohio. And there, you, when you're in the parking lot, you've got all these pickup trucks, and on the left side were the Bernie Sanders stickers, and on the right side were the Trump stickers. And when I talked to the local president, he said, look, all our members voted for Bernie in the primary and then they voted for Trump. You can't sell union people on free markets. You can't sell them on, you know, you, you know, true, Trump exactly. spoke. You know, the problem is Trump was lying, but he at least spoke to their concerns. And, you know, Biden kind of came in kind of like this working class image. Let's see. Uh, let's now walk the walk. I mean, I, you know, he started out kind of gangbusters. There was a little bit of FDR going on there. But now it's, uh, it's clear that Wall Street and, and the rest are beginning to uh, put their fangs in. I'm very concerned that if they don't get those union workers back in Ohio, why, is, why did Ohio go red? I mean, a lot of it was vote suppression, but I've got to tell you, going to those union halls, you cannot, you cannot sell workers the union More people garbage. are worried about yeah. their jobs on on free market and and trans and and NAFTA and, and and the rest. You have got to stand up and put people to work, and that's the issue. And infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about you know it's a fancy word, but it just says what makes things run. In other words, like for a railroad. You can have a great locomotive, but if you don't have the tracks, if you don't have that infrastructure, it ain't going nowhere. And that's what we're talking about. And, and again, you know, I, in, you know I'm, I'm in Europe. I go to Switzerland. You have to understand, those are granite mountains. You don't have wires in the air. Um, they underground through granite because um, they have avalanches. They have the weather. They, they're not surprised when there's a hurricane in a hurricane zone or an avalanche in the Alps. They expect it, and that's part of the system. They don't question whether you whether you uh, r- repair your infrastructure. It's like saying, I have a car, and, and the family's going to get together for a vote. We're thinking of voting on whether we should change the oil. 
And we've been waiting to change the oil for the past if, year. If you have the vote, you better make the decision <laughs> soon because you're not going to have any oil left. Oh, uh, exactly. Greg. Exactly. Pretty soon you're not going to have a car that's running. Yeah, exactly. So it's, like, it's, it's, beyond, it's absolutely insane. But you know what you don't do? You don't turn over infrastructure to privateers. We have... With very few exceptions, we have public roads, we have public water, and actually about a third of our power is publicly produced, and that stuff is, you know, uh, Bonneville Power Administration, Tennessee Valley Authority, the Rural Electric Cooperatives, these things are well operated, they run cheaply. I'm sorry, when you have a socialist product, that is, when everyone uses it and it's a monopoly, then you have to have public ownership of a public good. Right. And it by the way, basic. there are you're exactly right, and, and I'm glad that you turned the word socialism into a negative for the Republicans, because that's exactly what they do when you have monopolies. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. But here's the other point. Um, you know, you, you look at a situation with Cedric Richmond, who's the aide uh, to President uh, Biden now, comes from New Orleans. That's fossil fuel central. That's where all the oil comes from and so forth. So that's part yeah. of the reason why that, you know, I don't know if AOC and, and Markey with their environmental things are going to be welcome down there. Uh, and, and they're for and you get people like James Carville and others out there, you know, proponing the Louisiana lightning stuff. So, you know, that, those are some of the problems that, you know, they're running into on top of it all. It, it's it's really sad, really, really sad that, you know, this is where we are in 2021, where, where we should not be as arcane. Do you realize how many jobs you can create just by making things in America work? Of course. It You know, it's real simple. And and one of the reasons why the Swiss have higher incomes than we do, I mean, yeah, that's true. They, they take a lot of dictators' money from around the world and stuff it in their banks. But, but i got to tell you, uh, everyone, everyone is a union worker. Everyone is a skilled worker. There's no such thing as getting a non-licensed plumber. And what happens is, yes, you pay more for things, but everything works. I mean, everything right. works. And, people and on this Labor really Day weekend, well. think about where we would be without a 40-hour work week, of an eight-hour work day. We just had the Secretary the Treasurer, Mr. Redmond, on. Uh, you know, look how it has changed lives. It changed his family's lives. They were on welfare. Dad got a union job. Uh, Mom had a union job. And all of a sudden, they're out of poverty and they move forward. I mean, this, this should be where we go as opposed to declining unions in allowing the Amazons of the world and others uh, to try to screw people. Um, you know, this is where we, we should be going. And, and hopefully there will be some change. Greg, i got about 30 seconds. Take it all. Okay, well, uh, go to gregpalace.com and you'll get all of this. Just the facts, ma'am, on what was going on in Louisiana and why it's drowning once again. That's very important because we're all Louisiana eventually. We better be very careful. So true. Great way to end the uh, the show and the week. Greg Palace, gregpalace.com. Thank you, my friend. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That was uh, Greg Palace. Uh, this is Jeff Santos. As we make our way to the end of the week, again, folks, we won't be on uh, live Monday. We'll be back live on Tuesday. Harold Meyerson will be back with us. A little bit of vacation for him. Uh, th- think about this, folks. If we act and we put the pressure on the Biden administration as progressives, we can save the day. Without your pressure, which is why we always give out the phone number 202-224-3121, Congress puts the pressure on Biden. We can make a difference. So do just that. Have yourself a wonderful weekend with Jeff Santos. And right now... I-